Thank you to the Emerging Business Intelligence and Innovations Group, EBII Group, for inviting me to speak with you today. The Caribbean is Africa across the Atlantic. We all know that Africa is the birthplace of humanity. However, no place is as close demographically to Africa than the Caribbean. The Caribbean is the first born child of Africa, a child forcibly taken away from his mother at a tender age and beaten and tormented into identifying as someone they were not. And yet still, that child always knew something that was amiss and rebelled and demanded freedom. The child came to realize that the colonial mother country was merely a farce. She always yearned for a union with her mother. Our Caribbean people have for centuries yearned for that return to the promised land, a return to our true mother. Reggae superstar, the Honorable Robert Nestor Marley sang it well. How good and how pleasant it would be to be before God and man to see the unification of all Africans. And despite the fact that some of our ancestors would have been brought from Africa as many as 15 generations ago and forced to do away with their identities, we are back to where we all began, Africa. We have been staring at ourselves from afar for hundreds of years, as if looking at a mirage, being blurred and fooled into not seeing our resemblance in the mirror. Perhaps the solution born Nobel Prize 1992 winner for literature, Honorable Derek Walcott, foretold this moment in his poem, Love After Love. He writes, the time will come when with elation you will greet yourself, arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at each other's welcome. The Atlantic Ocean that separates us is that shared mirror. Mr. Chairman, many St. Lucians have played an important part in the development of Africa. Most notable is St. Lucian-born economist and Nobel Prize winner Sir Arthur Riss, who prepared Ghana's National Development Plan in 1957 when he served as UN Economic Advisor to the then Prime Minister Kwame Nkrumah. Africa and the Caribbean share the significant impacts of climate change. We are seeing an increased rate of the warming of our planet, leading to desertification, drought, and water scarcity. At the same time, our low-lying urban regions from Cape Town to Georgetown and from Lagos to Castries face the impact of storm surge and sea level rise. Water scarcity in particular impacts extractive industries from tourism to mining. For example, we are seeing already the power challenges that Ghana is facing with Lake Volta and the downside effects on its energy. We are seeing the tension over the use of the Nile River for hydropower. We in the Caribbean have been deemed the region in the world most vulnerable to natural disasters, particularly due to the impacts of hurricanes and tropical storms. Just a few weeks ago, we, we were witness to Hurricane Beryl, the earliest known major hurricane ever, and the impact on the Eastern Caribbean on Grenada, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Barbados, Jamaica, and St. Lucia. These hurricanes can wipe out the equivalent of years of economic activity in just a day. The Caribbean has been leading the way to point out that we need climate justice. We pollute the least but suffer the most. We actively dis dis advocated under the 1.5 to stay alive campaign in Paris climate meetings in 2015. Countries in the Caribbean and in Africa are essentially being told to adapt and become more resilient to climate change. However, telling countries that are already struggling to overcome years of systemic poverty and exploitation that they must be resilient is like telling the fish it needs to start learning to walk on land. Without sufficient financial resources, adaptation is but a pipe dream. In many instances, what we are left with are climate refugees and climate migration. 
It is everyone's business to provide Africa with the resources it needs to set out on a climate-resilient, sustainable pathway. Mr. Chairman, many countries in the Caribbean are known as SIDS, small island developing states. While countries in Africa may not be considered as small relative to the Caribbean, many are highly indebted and suffer from the twin effects of high indebtedness, unemployment, and as I mentioned earlier, the effects of climate change. In the Caribbean, we are in full alignment with the 1.5 degrees centigrade to be used as the basis for all discussions to and during COP29. However, our people are becoming increasingly restless and impatient as we fail to see the premises of climate financing for adaptation and mitigation. We continue to wait for the $100 billion promise made years ago to fund climate action. Our people were heartened when, at COP28, it was agreed that a loss and damage fund would be established and financed. However, as I speak, the fund has not received many of the promises. Mr. Chairman, while the science has proved that the more developed countries have been the greatest emitters and cause of climate change, we in the developing world continue to plead to the developed world and international financial institutions that traditional measures of economic performance cannot be used as an appropriate guide of our economic situation. We have largely called for vulnerability and climate factors to be used in our economic metrics. Last week, I'm told that the United Nations have accepted the use of the multi-vulnerability index as a factor in the measure of economic performance. We in the developing world call for quick practical application of that index at the earliest. Mr. Chairman, we also believe that there should be a calculation of how much of our indebtedness as a region is due to climate action and the portion of our debt due to these factors in the first instance should be written off or forgiven. We also believe that in our loan agreements with international financial institutions, there should be disaster clauses that ensure that loan payments stop after disaster and not compounded as overdue or late payments. Mr. Chairman, we align ourselves fully with the objectives of the Bridgestone Initiative and call for its consideration and adaptation. Mr. Chairman, the future of our planet, our economy, and our people can be destroyed in an instant with a hurricane. Our food security is threatened by drought on one hand and on the other extreme flooding. We see the daily effects of drought in Africa and its cause in the form of human suffering, starvation, and forced migration. Mr. Chairman, we in CARICOM believe that COP29 should be a finance COP. We need to consider the special circumstances of SIDS are formed in the United Nations Framework on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement. As a main priority for our CARICOM region and must be protected and operationalized, throughout the climate change policy agenda and reflected in the decision establishing the new collective quantified goal on climate change. It is important that Africa and the Caribbean find common areas where we can build our resilience and face the developed world with a unified position to save our planet through climate action. Today, Africa's population, Mr. Chairman, is 1.4 billion. It has about 18% of the global total. What is even more compelling of this reality is that by the end of the century, two out of every five people on earth would have been born in Africa. The age of Africa is upon us. The African baby boom is in full swing and it places both challenges and opportunities for the continent. Typical of the Western view, in 2018, The Economist magazine asked the question, what to do about Africa's dangerous baby boom? One out of every four babies born right now will be African. By the end of the century, it might well be one in two. And with this population boom, Africa is experiencing the fastest rate of urbanization in the world. For instance, 
Lagos is projected to be the world's largest city by the year 2100. And by the end of the century, 10 of the top 20 largest cities in the world will be in Africa. It is inevitable that Africa will become a global power if we are to achieve the world's sustainable development goals. Achieving these goals will require significant resources, which indeed Africa possesses. Africa has 40% of the world's mineral resources. 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land is in Africa. Over the past three decades, growth in agriculture production in Africa has been 160% and has outpaced the global average of 100%. And despite that, Africa remains a net importer of food. The continent could power itself primarily from renewable energy, particularly hydro, solar, and wind within 15 years. However, despite all the mineral renewable energy and arable land resources, Africa's most valuable resource remains its people. Moreover, Africa possesses a rising diaspora, which is must recall to itself. The Caribbean, the place that was transshipment point for millions of enslaved Africans brought to the Americas, can now become Africa's gateway to the Americas. The Caribbean community has rightfully been recognized as the sixth region of Africa. For the benefit of those who are not aware, the Caribbean community has been in existence since 1974, and today, CARICOM has 15 full member states. We are not just a chain of islands, but also include Guyana and Suriname in South America and Belize in Central America. We enjoy a single market, an economy with a customs union, a common appellate court, the Caribbean Court of Justice, a common university, and several functional corporation entities in health, education, environment, and agriculture, to name a few. CARICOM has a combined population of 18.8 million people across a landmass of 177,000 square miles and a total nominal GDP of US 82 billion. Put another way, we have a population about that of Chad across a landmass slightly smaller than Cameroon with an economy the size of Tanzania. For many years, our cooperation with each other was through our trading and legacy associations with Europe for the groupings such as the ACP and the Commonwealth. Today, we are actively driving our own cooperation thanks to the work of many of our institutions. Just this month, I was in the Bahamas attending the Africa Export Import Bank's 31st annual meeting being held outside the continent and for the first time in the Caribbean. This was more than a just a powerful gesture by the bank. The bank has seen the transformative power of the Africa-Caribbean bridge. It has seen opportunities to expand trade, investment, and development for partnership. The 41st annual meeting of the bank also had paired to it the third annual Afri-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum. This meeting focused on many crucial thematic areas important in action in trade and development in our region. This included sessions on recreating the middle passage for entrepreneurial partnership, the role of emerging Afro-Caribbean giants, mobilizing development financing for Africa's industrial and trade infrastructure, and the role of youth in shaping the next era of global Africa. Such a powerful meeting of the minds from political leadership to captains of industry helps us plan, collaborate, and coordinate our efforts across our 60 sovereign states. Afri Exim Bank is not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. They've established a Caribbean office in Barbados, and already St. Lucia has benefited in funding for upgrades to schools damaged during a recent storm and I'm already engaging them on potential interventions in expanding our housing stock for St. Lucia. In St. Lucia, we have coined the phrase youth economy, and it has been one of our many flagship initiatives 
for me as Prime Minister. Africa faces a youth employment challenge, and this will be overcome, not merely through direct investment, but also by direct youth involvement in an ownership of the economy. Locally, in St. Lucia, we created a youth economy agency to promote youth entrepreneurship, ensuring that our young people have access to funding, business, training, coaching, and support services so they can convert hobbies into entrepreneurship and skills into successful businesses within their own economic ecosystems. With the youngest population on earth, a youth economy must be central to Africa's rise to prosperity. We must therefore ensure that we do not miss the icons. We must do whatever we can to see the next Dangonti or the next Otidola or the next Matsepi. And hopefully, they might also come from our youth economy participants seeing the potential of Africa. Our youth are slowly but surely getting to Africa, but our transport and logistics arrangements are still dependent on the North. Marcus Garvey's hopes of a black star line is still but a dream. It was a dream shared by Matiba, the great Nelson Mandela, when he visited St. Lucia in 1998 for the 25th Caricom Heads of Government meeting and spoke at the constituency that I represent, the dream of direct air links between Africa and the Caribbean. Even in the Caribbean, air travel has been challenged post-COVID, and we have seen some interest by Nigerian investors in our air transport sector. Our governments must continue this strategy of bridging the middle passage by both sea and air. The Caribbean is the gateway to the Panama Canal, built by West Indian labor. Africa, a gateway to the Suez Canal, built by African labor. It is for us to rethink the global map with ourselves at the center, not at the periphery. Africa is, and has always been, at the center of the world. It also means that we must deal with the ease of travel as well. Believe it or not, St. Lucians can go to nearly every European country visa-free, but require visas prior to arrival for 21 African countries. Our Nobel Prize winner and development economist, Sir Arthur Lewis, said it well. The fundamental cure to poverty is not money, but knowledge. Know-how is how Africa can and will leapfrog into its rightful place as a global leader. Marcus Garvey said it this way. Never forget that intelligence rules the world and ignorance carries the burden. Therefore, Remove yourself as far as possible from ignorance and seek as far as possible to be intelligent. It was the first and second industrial rev revolutions that enabled Europe to colonize Africa and it will be technology that will enable a global Africa in the fourth industrial revolution. It therefore means that Africa and the Caribbean must plan quickly to make the best use of this bright, youthful, Africa-driven by know-how, especially in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. There must be the young people who will build the hydro dams, the solar PV plants, the highways and the railways, the electric grids, and the cities that Africa needs. It will be these educated young people who will innovate, heal, gain higher crop yields, fly our planes, captain our ships, lead honest, accountable governments, and create the wealth and prosperity that Africa needs. The Caribbean, I believe, can play its part in the development of Africa's education, skills, and development needs. The government of Botswana has for many years partnered with the University of the West Indies to train medical doctors. Many Nigerians come to St. Lucia to pursue medical programs in offshore universities here. We in the Caribbean must see it our duty to work with universities and colleges in Africa for scholarships, train-the-trainer programs, and potential student exchanges. Our future cooperation is exciting to say the least. 
This is a great time to be African. Africa is youthful. Africa is creative. Africa is diverse. Africa is rich. Africa is energetic. Africa is spiritual. Africa is home. And Africa is poised to be, the, to be great again, a dominant global power. We in the Caribbean are a small but influential part of a diaspora. There are over 100 million people of African descent in the Americas who can identify with their motherland. With a growing African-American population, with over a trillion in spending power. However, we must be mindful of the persistent power of oppression, exploitation, and division from within and without. We must therefore also utilize our advocacy as well as our financial resources and influence in this global effort. Africa needs its creeds and currently not being met. Our estimate has said that Africa needs over 400 billion in additional funding annually up until 2030 to achieve structural transformation and its SDG goals. This money will not materialize by remaining silent. I want to end with a message to all our leaders. Long before I was born, in October 1947, Marcus Garvey spoke in my constituency, Castries East in St. Lucia. There, at a building called the Closer Union Hall on Marshall Road, in my constituency. In July 1998, Mandela spoke nearby at the Mindu Philip Park on the same Marshall Road. Gavi and Mandela never shunned away from speaking and walking the road with the ordinary man. And so too, we here as leaders must do the same. I personally feel very close to the message of these great men and the many who went before me speaking out for bread justice and freedom for our people. It is why my mantra has been putting people first. I believe if we as a people of Africa and the Caribbean understand the struggles of our forefathers, we would never squander the opportunities that they only wished they could ever have, which we enjoy today. We have a long road ahead, but we are used to keeping calm, keeping still, despite the raging waters. I salute the EBII for the work that you continue to do to make Africa a better, more transparent, more accountable place to invest and reap reward. I end with a few more lines from Derek Walcott's poem, Love After Love. You will, you will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, Give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another who knows you by the heart. May Africa and the Caribbean be united forever. Ladies and gentlemen, all the best for your deliberations in the next few days. I thank you.